I don't know how to differentiate uh, the body and culture. To me, they are the same thing. You and I have very similar somocultural experiences because physiologically, nerve innervations happen the same for you and I. The experiences that led us to have those innervations differ, of course. And that's what I think I'm interested in is helping people understand that about themselves, like how your very specific culture, including where you were born and when you were born, and sometimes including to whom you were born to, is going to shape what you know and how you, how you write your work, how you talk about sexuality, how you even talk about physiology with your clients is, from my perspective, all based upon what you learned, based upon who you are. That's what soma cultural uh, perspective and what I call soma cultural liberation is based upon. Those intersections of identity and helping us understand the impact that it has on our soma or on our body. I'm Cindy Darnell. Welcome to The Erotic Philosopher, the podcast where we examine and explore sex and relationships through social, personal, cultural, scientific, political, and other lenses, and unpack and explore your erotic quandaries with the world's wisest erotic philosopher. Welcome back to Season 4 of The Erotic Philosopher, the podcast where we explore life, sex, and modern relationships with some of the world's wisest erotic philosophers. My name is Cindy Darnell. I'm a sexologist and sex and relationships therapist and coach, and of course, host of The Erotic Philosopher. I'm also the author of Sex When You Don't Feel Like It, The Truth About Mismatched Libido and Rediscovering Desire. You can find out more about me at my website, cindydarnell.com. Before we jump into today's interview, I want to tell you about a new project I'm working on, my online subscription community where you can learn more about the issues we tackle here on The Erotic Philosopher be they relational, personal, emotional, sexual, and beyond. So many of us need help and support making sense of our complicated lives and complicated relationships these days. So this new online community serves as a portal to learn more from me and from others as we dive into the issues most important to us in creating meaningful lives and fulfilling sex. You'll see more on my website, cindydarnell.com, under the Community tab. Now, let me introduce you to today's guest, Dr. Roger Kuhn, a Porch Creek Two-Spirit Indigiqueer Soma cultural activist, artist, sex therapist, and sexuality educator. Roger's work explores the concepts of decolonizing and unsettling sexuality and focuses on the way culture impacts and informs our bodily experiences. In addition to his work as a licensed psychotherapist, Roger is a faculty lecturer at the American Indian Studies of San Francisco State University. He's a board member of the American Indian Cultural Center of San Francisco, a community organizer of the Bay Area American Indian Two-Spirit Pow Wow, and a member of the LGBTQ Plus Advisory Committee of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. In 2022, Roger was featured in the Levi's Pride campaign. He is currently writing his first book, Soma Cultural Liberation, which will be published by North Atlantic Books in 2024. Roger Kuhn, welcome to The Erotic Philosopher. It's lovely to finally meet you. I feel like I've heard so much about you for a number of years now. So to actually have you in front of me, almost in person, virtually in person, is such an honor. So welcome. Oh, Mado, thank you. Stonko Heste, how you doing? Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and before we get into our conversation today, Roger, about your work, what would you like people to know about you that they may not know about you? Well, I always... Uh, seem surprised when folks when I share with folks that I love playing video games I am if I had more time on my hands I would be playing more video games I think that's always something that as a kid I just I'm, I'm from the 80s Atari Nintendo PlayStation I, I kind of if, if I could spend more time doing that kind of stuff I think I would be even more content than I am 
So that's always just like a little, a little fun fact about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, all these quirks that we have, you know, hiding in our, not even hiding in our closets, but just aspects of our lives, I guess, that don't tend to see the light of day because when we're in public, we tend to sort of be speaking about the thing that we speak about. Um, and so I, I'm always interested to know what, what folks are interested in other than sex and relationships and bodies and and politics and all the things that we talk about here. So, um, and so speaking of sex, relationships, politics and bodies, let's, let's go there first. Um, Your, you know, your work around uh, somatics, culture, bodies, and how they intersect with sex is incredibly profound. And that is how I first became familiar with your work. Talk us through your um your experience of that work to date and and where you're at with it now how it's sort of evolved and and where you're sitting with it right now well i always start with centering myself in the work i only had myself to go off of so my own experiences in therapy oftentimes were with uh white folks um actually now that i think about it <laughs> Hmm. I think most of my therapists also were not from the United States. They they had accents similar to yours. Um, now that I'm thinking about that, like, wow, I just I just had that realization right now, um, which in an odd way makes sense because it was always from this European construct. So my indigeneity uh, and even my queerness uh, always felt like, hmm, how does it actually fit into this framework you're giving me? And it wasn't that my therapists weren't open. They just didn't know how to speak to that part of myself, that uh, if I would express things around my sexuality that may have to do with the intersections of my identity as a mixed race native person, um, my therapist just wouldn't get it. And I would say, oh, but it's so important here. And there'd be this nuance that would be missed. And I would talk about my, my body like, oh, I maybe don't feel comfortable in certain spaces. Um, and so little by little, I, I realized like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm going to have to talk about this stuff myself. I'll have to figure out a way. And I began to then, you know, through my schooling, understand that largely in therapy school, uh, those of us that, you know, go to graduate school for psychology, we get a one multicultural counseling class, one. And in that you have to, you have to all the cultures come in and, uh, that is, um, not enough. Sexuality in and of itself is a culture, right? In, in my experience, when I was in graduate school, uh, sexuality was a one credit option. Now in the state of California, it is required one credit. One credit. I mean, we both know that you cannot talk about sexuality in one credit. You can barely do anatomy in one credit, right? It, it's so intense that that's the, the pressure that uh, I think psychotherapists are put under. Then you, you sit in front of a human being. And you're supposed to have empathy toward experiences they have. Well, if you've never uh, thought about your own relationship to colonization and the impact that it may have on bodies, your body or other bodies, then you may actually be missing and further, my perspective, perpetuating harm against clients um, when we when we have this ideology that a body is supposed to look like, do like, act like, respond in particular ways. That is bypassing historical trauma in many regards on many bodies. So I just thought, well, let me start talking about it. Let me start raising my hand in class and saying, well, actually from an indigenous perspective, or when you think about it from this perspective, and more and more, I realized in the field of, of uh, my advanced studies, when I was getting my doctoral degree, the field of sexuality also uh, was not very inclusive of culture. Again, it, it just seems funny that that would be true. At least the program that I was in didn't talk about the way that culture was influencing how our body shows up, how our body responds, how our body uh, feels pulled versus pushed. Uh, from, and from everything that I've really learned, again, centering my own self, my own experiences, uh, as well as my academic experiences, I don't know how to differentiate uh, the body and culture. To me, they are the same thing. You and I have very similar somacultural experiences because physiologically, uh, nerve innervations happen the same for you and I. The experiences that led us to have those innervations differ, of course. 
Um, and that's what I think I'm interested in is helping people understand that about themselves, like how your very specific culture, uh, including uh, where you were born and when you were born, um, and sometimes including to whom you were born to, is going to shape what you know and how you how you write uh, your work, how you talk about uh, sexuality, how you even talk about physiology with your clients is, from my perspective, all based upon what you learned, based upon who you are. And um, that's what somocultural uh, perspective and what I call somocultural liberation is based upon, those intersections of identity and helping us understand the impact that it has on our soma or on our body. Yeah. And I love the way, you know, that we're looking at this because, and I agree with you that historically psychotherapy in particular, um, you know, it, it's rooted in, in very much in European thought. It is rooted very much in the pathology of the individual. It wasn't really until later on in the 20th century that it started to become about systems and, and broader movement that was always, you know, what's wrong with you, individual? Why are you, you know, struggling, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then because I was trained in Australia, which is not vastly different to the US, but it's different enough in some ways. And, um, you know, a lot of my teachers when I was learning psychotherapy were white. And then interestingly, when I was learning human sexuality, I did my master's degree at the University of Sydney, the vast majority of my teachers were Indian. And that was, and they were Christian which was a really interesting mix because they were, and because of the Christian element, there was a certain um, conservatism, I think, that was brought to the narratives that there was a reluctance to talk about things like sex work. There was a reluctance to talk about sex, uh, you know, outside of a relational monogamous construct. And, you know, these kinds of things were really fascinating to me because I had been immersed in sex worker politics for years prior to that. I had been immersed in, you know, what's now called sexological body work in that sort of culture, that kind of scene for years prior. And those kinds of practices at that time at the University of Sydney were shunned, were considered, you know, bad, let's say. Um, and so I think, you know, what I, my observation anyway, in how conversations have changed at a clinical level, at an academic level, let's say, in the last maybe 10 years, is that so many more voices are coming in. Um, and then when I did, a, I did a master's degree in narrative therapy, which is much more um, systems focused, and certainly much more very, very intersectional, and very intercultural as well. And then going into that space, how when, again, I talked about sex and sex work, how that was received often um, by well-meaning feminists as, you know, they were aghast and horrified at, again, at this idea of, of the embodiment of eroticism outside of relational structures. So that sort of, it makes me think about that in terms of culture, how outside of a US context, these things can sort of, again, play out quite differently how, from the conversations I hear happening in the US that don't necessarily match what I, I see and hear happening in, in other parts of the, let's say, you know, Western world. Sure. I mean, e even something like na narrative therapy and have original approach, right? You know, sort of like, wh wh where, does the, where do the roots from that therapy modality come from? And, you know, it's very challenging, I think, in my work, Cindy, to, um, you know, I say to folks, like, my work is unfortunately rooted in violence. Uh, it, it just is. It just is. If, I, if I'm talking about Indigenous people and I'm talking about sexuality, yes, I'm talking about violence. And also, that means I have to talk about Christianity in a way that may be very uncomfortable for folks who maybe identify as Christians or were raised in a, a sect of Christianity. It could be Catholicism, could be Lutheranism, what have you. But to say, though, from perspective of an indigenous worldview, uh, whether that be in what we now refer to as the United States, Canada, or even places like Australia and New Zealand, to say sexuality and Christianity and colonialism that is such an intense and deep conversation that, of course, impacts um, the perspective of, of erotic embodiment and, and why uh, 
academic sexuality is, is in the head. It's all heady. And I think so many folks who are like professional sexological body workers, therapists, what have you, when we go into these academic spaces to, to get uh, PhDs, to be doctors, we're like, what the, you know, I don't know if I can swear on this podcast. Yeah, 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 but, you, you totally know, can. Totally, totally, totally. What totally, the, totally, fuck? Totally. What the yeah. fuck is this? What the fuck is this? Because we're so about our bodies. And then we get into these PhD programs or these graduate level programs like, y'all are in your fucking heads. How, you're missing the point of all of this pleasure, uh, sexuality. It's all based, it has to be based on the body. When you, when you study academics um, and you get pulled into the head, I think, you, I, I think people do that because it's safe. Because then you don't, you know, to, to, to talk about the erotic embodiment means I have to like be into the space of like, Cindy, I might be feeling my pelvis when I'm with you in this conversation. I may be feeling some warmth. I may be feeling some thickness, some swelling. Whoa. That, that's, you know, that's much more real and, of course, much more vulnerable than to say, let's talk about erotic colonization from the idea of Christian domination in Australia and the United States. Right? That, keep it heady. Keep it heady. And I think that that's what part of, part of my work is to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to nudge you with the erotic colonization piece and then, of course, bring in the body. I'm not going to ignore the soma. Uh, there, 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 there's no pleasure in for me, even as an educator, to be able to share indigeneity or indigenous sexuality, in particular my work around two-spirit and indigenous sexuality, to then say, and I'm also a body-oriented person. And so, of course, we're going to talk about the body and the way that all of this stuff that you're learning impacts your body, which then means how does it impact the way you choose to share your sexuality, which may include a behavior, a behavior. In light, you know, do you give do you give blowjobs differently? You know, when when you really think about these things, do you do you relax differently? Do you do you notice a different sensation in your pelvis when you go through your own somewhat cultural process of understanding who you are, understanding your relationship to a lot of these complexities? Most importantly, though, as a the body as a tool and an access point for pleasure. That's what I hope my work ultimately gets to i just have to sort of you know again it's like well we kind of have to start talking about that challenging stuff i'm not going to bypass that stuff and i'm also here to say and i'm still here and i'm thriving by the way right right i mean i have these ancestors who've had this really challenging world and some of us have navigated through those or are navigating i should say are navigating through those complex systems and, uh, you know, we have doctoral degrees and we're in the sexuality field and we're talking about these complex issues and erotic embodiment at the same time. Yeah. And so for you, how, where these worlds intersect in contrast with where, um, you know, again, I'm sort of thinking about the, my relationship working with some uh, indigenous colleagues of mine in Australia who are social workers and psychotherapists working primarily with Aboriginal communities, um, that sexuality certainly in m multiple Aboriginal cultures is not necessarily something that is talked about. It's it's not, uh, it, it was often sort of spoken. I mean, there was permission for me to speak about it in my context, but the, the, it was never something that would be embraced particularly. I'm talking about, you know, my particular colleagues. So I'm curious about how you experience talking about sexuality through this lens um, and whether or not there are, there's also sort of pushback around being able to embody eroticism um, through that lens and how how it's how it is perceived and experienced by some of the the broader peers that you have who are indigenous folks sure well you know i always like to somewhat make a joke but i'm also serious to say i, I speak white fluently don't worry i, I speak whiteness fluently um and that, that 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 is partially true because i i am part white my father's white my mother's indigenous um, and I was raised primarily identifying as an indigenous person, though also raised with a white family. And in, I grew up in North Dakota. You know, I mean, it's pretty, I, I don't want to say it's pretty white there because it, uh, it was very native and white when I was, when I grew up, it was still very segregated though. And I'm not native from North Dakota. My mother is native from the state we now call Alabama. So 
I was raised, you know, in a mixed race house, a mixed culture, um, and then also amongst mixed indigenous people. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of these layers. Um, so the joke is like, don't worry, I speak quite fluently. Um, and then I say, and then I'm learning how to speak indigeneity more fluently because as an indigenous person, I know my tribe really well, or I hope that I know my tribe, Porch Creek really well. I can't speak for Lakota people. I can't speak for Diné people. I can't speak for Ohlone people. And so to put this broad blanket of sexuality on indigenous people and have very few indigenous, you know, dare I use the word scholars, uh, talk about these things, meaning I got to talk about sort of everybody, right? Um, and that's a challenge. A lot of, a lot of sexuality professionals uh, sort of get to talk about their culture, cultural group that they may be from, and not have it be so tribally specific. Or you can sort of blanket and say like, well, in France, so I'm blanketing France or I'm blanketing Germany. But in, with indigenous communities, uh, we are as distinct, Porch Creek people are as distinct as French and German as are Porch Creek and Cherokees. Um, we have similarities, though a lot of differences. So I think a lot about, again, um, the, the benefit of not talking about sexuality if, from an indigenous perspective is that, well, um, we're not talking about it. Hopefully you're not thinking about it, meaning not you, uh, it's you specific of it, meaning like the settlers or the colonial government. Hopefully you're not thinking about us uh, because we're still having babies, because we're still creating families, because we're still having sex. Um, and so, shoot, if you know that about us, maybe you'll impose even more restrictions on us. Maybe you'll do even more harsh things. I mean, my goodness, the um, Indian Child Welfare Act is, is up in the Supreme Court this week, Cindy. This week, Indian Child Welfare Act could, could be abolished in the United States. This came into this came into policy that came in in 1978, which protected Indigenous children from being adopted by primarily white people, so that Indigenous children could be raised in their culture, and that if for some reason the parent was unavailable to care for that child, perhaps somebody from that tribal community could take care of that child. Which then we get to keep uh, the the culture alive, and um, as opposed to forced assimilation, right? So. Um, these things are ongoing, like the, 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 the imposition of colonial sexuality is ongoing. If we're thinking about adoption structures, like, again, you're forcing you're, this case that's going into the United States Supreme Court this week is, again, forcing Indigenous people to, uh, if we think about sexuality in that broad sort of way, family structures, from my perspective, fall under that umbrella. You're forcing Indigenous people, again, to assimilate to European white ways of what family means. This is 2022. So I, again, have to include indigeneity in my work. Um, and the, the, the challenge with that is that maybe there aren't that many folks who do talk about it, but though the ones that do are amazing. Kim Talbert, Wow. If you or your audience has never heard Kim Talbert talk about um, what, what she would call critical monogamy or critical polyamory, really from this like settler construct um, about the way that relational structures are imposed upon indigenous bodies, uh, it, I, I think she's brilliant. And uh, I, knowing that there's someone like Kim Talbert out in the world, I also think of Michael Yellowbird, who talks about neurodecolonization. And really thinking and using those terms of a neuroscience uh, uh, from a decolonial perspective. And then you have the amazing number of, of artists and poets, Kent Monkman, Damien Dineyati, uh, for example. And then there's me, right? And I'm talking, I'm bringing this idea of indigeneity into sexuality, specifically from a sex educator or from a sex therapist perspective, which also makes my work somewhat unique in the, in the field of, of sexuality in general, um, as there aren't many folks like me doing the work that I'm doing or being able to talk about it the way that I'm talking about it because of my own unique history, my own unique background. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I appreciate you sort of flagging these distinctions between um, different communities, different tribal groups, and, and then also the that sense of sort of having to also extrapolate from white settler European values 
then, well, you know, what does that mean for different groups? What does that mean for you as an individual? What does that mean between you and me, for example? What what are the the things that we need to be mindful of, you know, even in our conversation, when I say we need to be mindful of, I, I think I'm probably referring to myself more so because there are going to be faux pas that I will make through sheer ignorance. And, um, and, and the, you know, this is the work of people who carry the skin that I carry, whether it is, you know, my fault or not, it, it's my fucking labor to do. And, you know, I'm here for it frankly. So this is, it's so important that we can start deconstructing how we look at sex, how we look at relationships and, and whose labor it is, whose work is it to do to, to start just stepping back and, and either speaking up or shutting up. Cause sometimes the work is about, you know, shutting up. And I, and I think that this is, is, is an important part of it too. Well, you're, you're also making me really think about, um, the, the particular privilege and access that I may have because of the choices that I, I made around going to school, getting a doctoral degree, that within the field that we're in, um, being able to call myself Dr. Roger Kuhn or Roger Kuhn, comma, PhD, it matters to people. Whether or not it matters to you and I personally, um, it, it matters to the field. And um, so there's even that, that, that piece here around well, uh, I get to speak for particular reasons. Um, there's also like a way that I'm, I'm not critical of myself, meaning uh, I, 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 I'm not like from a self-esteem perspective, though I sort of think about from a critical race perspective, like how um, I'm also easy for a lot of people uh, because a lot of white folks can look at me and go, well, you, you kind of look like us. Um, or like, I can see my features in you, or like, we know you're part white, so you're a, you're a safe one, right? It's this idea of like, again, it's almost this extractive thing of like, we can own you. You're, 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 half, you're half one of us. And it's like, you don't get to decide that for me. Uh, nobody does but me. Not even my parents got to choose uh, how I felt in the world. I can tell you what my experiences have been. Um, and my experiences have not been, people have not treated me like your typical white gay boy. I've never had that experience ever in my life. It's always been other in some regard. Um, and, and so in that regard, it's, it's also like, well, uh, uh, talking about challenging things, colonialism, trauma, uh, sexual violence, which is oftentimes a part of like my presentation, one or two slides. It's not, it's not all of it, but there's always a few slides there. You know, sometimes the, the, the critique that I want to make, too, is that, like, yes, and it's easy for folks when I come in and do it with the style or the flair that I do it. Um, and that's something else to be critiqued in another way, right? Because that, that's, that's somewhat about uh, respectability politics and how I may, as a presenter or a performer, have learned how to entertain particular audiences based upon what culturally is normative for that group. That's a whole other conversation. No, no, have, but it, right? I, it really, it's, and it's, it's very strong, I think, in the US in particular. You know, I know like even when I first moved here, my degrees were not recognized by most of the, the bodies that hand out licenses and certifications and whatever. They're like, what, Australia? No, you don't count. Um, and so it was, it was such an odd thing to go from being somebody who, was considered uh, a respectable, knowledgeable uh, person of value to being uh, someone whose entire academic history was just erased because I studied in the wrong country. Um, and and it was it was fascinating to see how strongly that played out, you know, in the US, which, yes. um, you know, I guess it is what it is here. I'm not here to change that necessarily. But the pecking order thing in the US is, yeah, it's especially strong is my. Yeah, I mean, that, that's true for, you know, the, 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 the funny thing about that is like, that's even true for indigenous people, like, you know, that our, our knowledge systems are not good enough for the government, right? That's why we had boarding schools. That's why we have assimilation. That's why we have all of these things that I'm sure as someone who's relatively new to living in the U.S., you don't know any of this stuff, right? It's like, Cindy, the things I could tell you about indigeneity and the particular laws that have been enacted um, for centuries on indigenous bodies that, of course, pertain to sexuality because they, they, they pertain to land and they, they have 
They pertain to access to land and who, what's on land bodies, what do bodies have sexuality? All of this stuff, at least in the United States, are so intricately linked that um, it, is, it is like imperative that we all have some framework of that stuff because without that, again, it's sort of like, well, you know, sexuality, sex therapy here in the U.S. may be a little different from how it's done in Europe or, or other places because we have this horrible thing called colonialism and slavery that did terrible things to bodies. And it made certain bodies believe that they had access to other kinds of bodies, even when those laws went away. It didn't necessarily shift the cultural norm because Americans are so in their fucking heads, right? It's sort of like the work that we're trying to do to, to help people engage at least their nipples you know if you can get at least if we can get them at least below the nipple right yeah. I mean, what a revolution we could have what a fucking revolution and so many of my clients are are i would use the word so hungry for that uh, to be able to fall into their bodies in ways that feel safe because so many of us walk around with a kind of what i would call hypervigilance whether, whether you have a vulva or a penis, or, or um, regardless of what you, your, your anatomy or how you might even identify in the world from a gender perspective, there is a hierarchy. Uh, again, I, I will speak from my perspective as someone that was born and raised in what we now call the United States. There's a hierarchy of gender norms in this country and sexual orientation norms in this country. And from the very beginning foundings of this country, based on gender and sexual orientation alone, violence was the tool that was used to suppress those. I know because I come from that culture. So your body, um, how I might receive you as what I'm going to call like a, a white person um, who may identify as a woman, uh, your body has also been suppressed here, maybe not to the same degree as mine, though I'm sure you've learned how to, oh, you're walking down a dark street in New York City, tighten up, get a little, get a little tight, right? Um, now imagine some of us do that our have have been doing that our entire lives, have been holding ourselves in these hypervigilant postures because I'm constantly afraid that either on the micro level, meaning maybe right at home or like at school, somebody's going to bully me because of my perceived difference. Could be my race, could be my sexuality or my gender. Or the larger world is going to tell me that I don't really belong. And that might be true for me because my mom lives on something called a reservation. <laughs> Why does that reservation exist? Oh, of course, because, oh, they tried to kill my ancestors and they didn't get them all. And my mom lives on one of those. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's the reality that a body like mine experiences. So then if I'm holding this, this hypervigilance around because I'm so... Uh, I get all of these messages everywhere that it's not safe for me. How am I supposed to fuck with true pleasure and reckless abandonment? If I'm, if I'm going into these spaces of like, is it safe here? Gay spaces, the fucking gay discotheque club spaces sometimes are the most fucking racist spaces I've experienced. And gay folk need to realize white entitlement is rampant in our community as well. Um, I mean, you can look at so many boards of LGBT leadership organizations, and you, you might see a few tokenized uh, BIPOC folk, you know, that might be on their board, but mostly it's still, again, it mirrors the larger dominant society. Um, even organizations like ASECT, um, you know, mirror like this larger dominant society. So I, you know, I, even within an organization like that, you know, my work somehow seems revolutionary. It's like, and this organization been going on for 50 years? Y'all telling me in 50 years, you've had very little indigenous representation? Hmm. And, I, you know, that's strange to me. Like, nobody thought of this beforehand? Or if you did, nothing was done to recruit folks like myself into your organization? Uh, yeah, I think they're doing better now. But it's just the, the the field itself is needy of that critique and needy of that um, what we're talking about today, which is like this expansion of the erotic embodiment from just this space to like again down 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 to my toes if I can seeping into the floor. 
I hope you're enjoying this episode of The Erotic Philosopher as much as I enjoy bringing it to you. I love being able to introduce these guests from around the world to you, and in return, it would help me enormously if you would go to Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave The Erotic Philosopher a rating and review. Your labor there helps this podcast land in front of people's eyes and ears, and what better way to help create a more inclusive and supportive world than spreading more information to more people, and you'd be doing a great favor to me too. If you would like to find out more about working with me, head over to my website, that's cindydarnell.com, where you'll see my offerings as a therapist or coach for a streamlined and personalized service, plus my online pleasure school under the online courses tab, where you'll find a suite of pre-recorded classes ready to go. There's something there for everyone. You'll also find my online community under the community tab where you can join me and others just like you navigate the topics we discuss here on The Erotic Philosopher and so much more. There's no shame in needing support to better understand these complex parts of our lives and I am here to support you every step of the way. We're also on Instagram and Twitter at The Erotic Philos, that's P-H-I-L-O-S. You can also follow me on social media. I am at Cindy, C-Y-N-D-I, underscore D-A-R-N-E-L-L on Instagram, TikTok, and on Twitter. Thanks for joining us here today. And now let's get back to the episode. So let's, you know, let's kind of pivot into this part of the discussion around, um, you know, I, you and I especially could sort of sit and theorize probably until the sun goes down. But let's talk about for folks listening here, how does how does this theory of of erotic embodiment apply? How how do we start even undoing this work of, you know, tight asses, tight pussies, tight, you know, hearts, tight shoulders, tight hands, tight jaws, tight, oh, you know, everything. <laughs> and whether we're bracing um, to protect ourselves or whether we're bracing against oncoming harm or whether we're bracing because it's just not safe to exhale in this street or in this town or in this neighborhood or whatever, wherever we are. How do we begin the work of softening in such a way that is both safe and also uh, inviting <clears throat> of others to come into our space how do we how do we begin to even apply that at a, at a somatic level at a visceral level well, I'm appreciative of just a moment ago when you said, uh, I have to paraphrase now, but you said something about how do we get people to do, and then you exhale the work. And I thought, well, right, there's a really great place to start. The exhalation is a wonderful place to begin. Wonderful. And then the inhalation follows, right? To like be, begin anew in this perspective. And what I like to do, again, is I like to situate folks. I I want to know, if I'm reading your book, I want to know a little about you. I do, because I want to know, like, okay, this perspective, which is really great, it's really good, though it is from a very specific lens, and here's the lens it comes from. Okay, cool, right? I want to know that as a reader, and, um, and I learned that as, like, uh, what we call, like, positionality, identity. But, you know, positionality is a big, fancy, heady academic word. It just means identity. When you cross that, when you intersect that with another big fancy word, epistemology, which is one of my favorite words, by the way, uh, which, means, uh, <laughs> which means what we know, it just means what we know, how we know what we know. So the intersection of my identity and how I know what I know, that's the lens I look at the world. So I think, folks, it's really beneficial for you to like sit down with yourself and figure some things out. From um, I use something called the bold addressing model. The addressing model comes from Pamela Hayes' work, who was a white social worker who was working with Alaska Native folk in Alaska and realized, like, wow, my cultural competency is pretty low. So she sat with herself and kind of uh, figured out this um, acronym that she was using with folks. And when I read about her work, I thought, oh, that's great. You left out the body, Pamela. <laughs> you know, in um, her acronym, you know. And so for me, like, that's really important though because. 
Um, sometimes when I think about my body, I forget I'm five eleven, Cindy. I know we haven't met in person, but I'm tall, and I oftentimes will wear a little bit of a heel. So I often I'm about six feet, and I'm about like any anywhere between one eighty five and one ninety. I'm thick, you know. Like I I feel like I take up space, and sometimes I forget like a body like mine, depending on your life experience, may not feel comfortable with me. Nothing to do with me, based on my body alone. So I want to know that about myself. I want to know that like wow. There is this cultural perception that bodies like mine could be perceived as dangerous. Now, that, that's just about my height and my weight. That's not about my skin color, which, you know, is above average. Uh, it's a little bit more on the tan side. I'm more on the, the tan spectrum. That also is, by some people, seen as dangerous. Um, and I want to know, know about that because uh, I get stopped at airports a lot, um, you know, randomly selected, but it, it happens to be a lot. And... And instead of being like, oh, fuck you, girl, it's like, oh, of course. Well, I live in a racist society. Someone sees skin color like mine. They're not quite sure. I could be, you know, any number of ethnicities, which could be problematic based upon this. So all of that to me is like, again, know yourself. Use the bold addressing model. Like understand your body, all these varied aspects of your body. Understand what I call occupy, like the land you occupy. Learn about the native people that you're part of, your lifestyle, the things that you desire in your life. And then you have the addressing model, which is Pamela Hayes' work, which talks about like all of these things about your identity, such as your age, whether you have any disabilities, your socioeconomic status, your religion, your sexuality, your uh, indigeneity, a nation of origin, gender, et cetera. It's, it's quite a, uh, I think, a, a beautiful um model to use because then you can say, okay, all of these things are about me, about how I view myself right now. What does this have to do with how I feel about abortion? What does this have to do with how I feel about uh, erectile difficulties? Because if you, from my perspective, if you are a cisgender uh, man and uh, you're having erectile, or let's just say ejaculatory issues, because that's generally even less talked about in, in the work, a uh, uh, lot of ED stuff, less ejaculatory stuff. But let's say though, like you believe, you believe that a man is supposed to be able to last 10 minutes and then you're supposed to shoot just an enormous amount of ejaculate onto your partner. Because that is the, that's the image you've, you've, re, you've learned and you, they think they've embodied that. That's, that's the, that, that's, that's the mental issue. That's an intellectual thing, right? So um, again, it's sort of like understand where you came from, how that impacts what you know, what you learned. So maybe, maybe that means that your idea of what you learned about virility doesn't actually belong to you. Your body doesn't believe that. And helping people um, let go of those false belief systems by having them recognize who they are. As you know, it, and to me, it's not about individuation because I think that's the problem with our culture is that we individuate so much. But within that individuation, it's individuation within this larger macro system. So we don't, I don't think about Roger Kuhn as a mixed race, uh, two spirit, indigenous queer, uh, gay uh, compared, you know, to um, the larger, maybe American political structure. Um, I'm probably just thinking about Roger Kuhn. Um, who lives in California? That's how they want me to think. That's how we're. That's how we're educated to think in a very linear fashion. And I'm suggesting that like nobody's linear. Uh, nobody's linear. We are spherical in nature. We are multi-intersectional in nature. And the more I believe that we can understand the way that culture shapes and informs our own bodily experiences. It gives us a greater sense of ease and, or big word here, liberation in the world, so that I might be able to hold myself less constricted. I would rather hold myself less constricted than to stay in this space of like, er, all the time. And again, the only way that I know how to do that, and that comes from indigenous epistemologies, is to center yourself in the work. Who am I in relation to the, the field of sexuality? Who am I in relation to the field of uh, uh, medical sexual physiology? Um, th that might be that like, well, my worldview predominantly hasn't been welcomed in these spaces. Um, so I have to, I have to make it available. 
but I have to be able to also, you know, get in the field and also say sometimes people use things even in our field that come from indigenous practices that they don't say where it comes from. And that's harmful. Um, it, even to your, your colleagues in the field who represent these communities, it's harmful to us because then when I do my work, sometimes folks will say to me like, oh, this is like so-and-so's work. Uh, no. <laughs> where do you think they got this from? Where do you think it came from? You think I stole from them? That's offensive. It's like, no, other folks borrowed from indigenous cultures, didn't claim it, or became so popular that they, they stopped claiming it. So that when I talk about indigeneity and their similarities, it's like having to then, uh, the, the double layer that I'm required to do uh, emotionally and physically as an indigenous scholar in the sexuality field is just like, I can only imagine. And obnoxious. Yeah. 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 And all power to you for soldiering on because I can see how it would feel insurmountable given the social climate, given, you know, given everything in particular that, that Indigenous folks in the United States have had to face, that then to even have the fucking audacity to talk about pleasure <laughs> yeah <laughs> is, right is, exactly is thing you know that's a real mm -hmm. thing and mm -hmm. um it's for you to not feel resentful perhaps you do i don't know if you do you don't seem to but um if you did i'd be like yeah i get it yeah i certainly i i don't Hmm. I don't know if I was resentful, but I was certainly jealous. I was jealous of the fact that like, oh, well, why can't I just, um, cause sometimes like, I just wanted to be a therapist, you know? And, and I always say to folks like, um, you know, I, I love doing the, the, the public speaking gigs. Uh, I'm a hell of a therapist. My, my schedule is packed. I am busy because I'm good at what I do. And what I do isn't always, you know, to sit down and tell my white clients, well, indigenous people, I mean, I don't necessarily bring that into the work because it's not about that, but I might have a specific lens that's helpful to them. Again, because sometimes I just want to be a, I just want to be a therapist. It's when I'm in these spaces though, especially these learning spaces, learning environments. So they go, I'm not just a therapist though. That's what makes me so unique is I'm not just, I'm also indigenous. I'm also two spirit. I'm also indigenous. I'm also gay. And I want to invite all parts of myself there to have the most authentic experience, which I recently just learned that authenticity is the intersection of truth and trust, which I thought was so brilliant when I heard it that way, because I've never really understood what authentic meant. I thought, what is authenticity? Please, someone help me out. And I was reading this book by uh, Tunde Ayundin from uh, one of the Peloton instructors, and she talks about that in that moment, about uh, intersection of trust and truth. And I thought, wow, that to me is so true about what I am doing in my life is I'm being as truthful as I can to be open and honest with someone like yourself to say, I am this, here is my work, and I'm going to trust that the message that I am sharing with the world is good. Um, one of the things that I, I, I started saying really, real early on in my educational work is that uh, somebody once upon a time, made whatever you and I are talking about up. They made it up. Somebody made this up. So guess what? You and I can make stuff up too. And for me, like I did not make up some cultural liberation. People have been talking about the body and culture and liberation for thousands of years in different ways. Maybe not so much in the field that you and I are in, which is a kind of narrow sex education, sex therapy, sex counseling world that we might run in professionally, um, though this topic has been talked about in so many ways by so many people um, in so many different uh, expressions that um, I could spend my career just on talking about how other people talk about this from an indigenous sexuality perspective. And yet I'm choosing to talk about it in the way that I do, because it also helps me. It helps me like as a human being to talk about these things um, and to let folks know that yes, all of this really horrible stuff happened to people like me, and yet people like me still exist. And which means that 
um, in reality, a body like mine, a queer body like mine, is one of the most indigenous things about the land that we're all on. Um, and I always say that as you know, as a way to welcome, especially gender nonconforming trans folks, non-binary folks, as a way to say that, well, I come from a culture that actually says very different than what this uh, particular ideology that we might have in the U.S. about trans and non-binary people it's like well first off that is that is anti-indigenous which folks never seem to like bring up but to me it's like anything that's anti-trans anything that's anti-non-binary anything that's anti-lgbt is anti-indigenous first and foremost it is anti-indigenous because if we had these practices prior to colonization start there folks start there like bring in that intersection it is so important because again otherwise it centers a particular group of people usually white bodied folks who get a lot of the attention but it's like well actually any of those any of those anti-gender anti-orientation measures or ideologies or perspectives are also and primarily anti-indigenous when you begin to link the when when we, when we begin to understand that all of those things are in, in intricately related we can all take more of those breaths you did a moment ago, like, and go, oh, wow. Wow, my relationship to, oh, occupy the land that I occupy, the native people, I don't have a relationship. That's why I don't know this. I need to understand a little bit more. I need to recognize uh, how do I perpetuate these thoughts? How do I continue to be a part of this, uh, these systems that, that uh, again, you know, do horrible things like, potentially erase years of progress with the Indian Child Welfare Act. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty intense. You know, I, I work as a, um, in addition to a, as a clinician, you know, I also work as a scholar of American Indian studies. And so I teach courses on, on Native American feminism, and I teach a class called Queer Sexual, Native Sexuality and Queer Discourse, which is all about LGBT, two-spirit, and queer folks. And then I also teach a course on the way that um, American Indian people are perceived in the media. And that class is for like 200 level students. So basically like a freshman could come in and take that class. And most of the feedback that I get from those students was like, I had no idea that this was the way that all of these things have been set up. Like the, the way that we sort of visualize native people, um, you know, all comes from like these particular photographs that were out in the late 19th century to the types of films that people were introduced to when, when uh, Hollywood started to make, uh, make large films or even the way that we see powwows today sort of all come from this very limited, narrow um, uh, perspective. It's, it's just even like sort of that recognition that like, again, like perhaps the way that folks see Native people or rather don't see Native people and therefore don't see Indigenous sexuality is intentional. You're not supposed to. Assimilation is a real thing. And assimilation applies to sexuality. Your sexuality has also been assimilated. Uh, your body has been assimilated. I, I, I love Sonia Renee Taylor's work of the, of the, uh, the body is not an apology. And she talks about, um, the, 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 uh, body profit shame complex. I, I think that's the idea, but you know, all these ways that like, you know, oh, I, my, oh, I smell. So I, I have to buy a uh, deodorant, Ooh, you know, that's, that's $3 a can. And, oh, I, my, my skin's dry. I got to buy lotion or I got to, I got to buy all these things to make my body more presentable for your body. I don't want you to think I'm gross, which again, in so many ways is deeply rooted in <laughs> all of these terrible things that we talk about. Like uh, I really dislike it when people say things like the wild West, what the hell are you talking about? What was wild about it? Oh, you mean the people? You mean the people you, you're talking about like, you know, the, the wild native people. Oh, okay. All right. So is that like what that, that you know, phrase means? What else does it mean when people talk about the wild? Uh, yeah, West, I don't know. I mean, thought like, I didn't know what it meant. I it's yeah. I mean, I, I think of it in the only in the context of Hollywood, and I think of cowboy movies. But but well, my right. again, my knowledge of of American history is sort of you know wonky. Best, so, so. What, what we we have to we have to take it to that level because it's like don't forget there are bodies over on that that wild land, and and if something's wild, you can tame it, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's the true, I, I, I think we hear that so much about like uh, women's sexuality, you know, and there was a really popular book in the nineties, like women who run with wolves or something like that. Um, and there was this whole like subset of like a subset of these like wild women reclaiming their wildness. And it's like, think about that from an indigenous women's perspective. Like 
these women, we were, de- my ancestors were denied their ability to run with the wolves. And now y'all are just skipping out in the fields, like, fuck y'all, like, pause for a moment and think about the harm you might actually be perpetuating on bodies that were not legally allowed to do that. And now you get to come here and frolic. To me, it's a sort of, again, like, the larger questions that I just, I cannot be the only person that's asking these questions uh, in our field. There, there needs to be more of us in the the, the the challenge with that though is like the accessibility and who can afford to get a master's degree who can afford to go through something like asex certification you know like all of that stuff is expensive and gosh you know that's that's another that's another show Cindy. that is a whole other episode <laughs> and and i would love to have you back again another time if that would be something you would enjoy doing and with that in mind roger unfortunately we have to start mm-hmm. wrapping up but um before we finish up uh, I do want to remind people that links to your work and your website and things are going to be in the show notes. And you're working on a book uh, in the coming year, um, which is about the, some of the things that we've talked about here. Is yes. it a book? Uh, is it going to be an academic book? Is it a popular press book? What sort of where are you pitching the book? What's the intention with that? Um, my intention is that anybody could read this book, that it's not an academic text. It is a book that uh, uh, if you are if you are looking for a way to understand your relationship to the intersections of your identity more, this is a wonderful book to do that. And in particular, if you're interested in examining your own cultural experiences and influences, then even more so that you will enjoy my book, which I'm tentatively calling Soma Cultural Liberation, A Path to Returning Toward Ourselves. Uh, so it's this way of like, hopefully my work inspires folks to just to get back in touch with who they really are as people, as a community, so that we can grow and heal together and fuck and have joy and pleasure and all those things. <laughs> <laughs> and all those things. And it's, all you know, just because it's, it's all, all of it is so important that, you know, to be able to, to be able to extrapolate the pleasure for some of us requires being able to extrapolate what pleasure is for all of us. And for when, when there are some of us who don't get to have it or don't get to have it in the ways that are especially meaningful to them on their terms, we all are involved in having to, to break down how it is we got to the place that we got to and how it is that we, you know, even believe the things that we believe, which, you know, at the t- top of our conversation actually provides we our recording when um you know we talked about the opening passage of my book about we are in a place now where we have access to information and you know so-called freedoms that that folks wouldn't have even dreamed of several thousand years ago and yet still we're fucked you know because there are still so many things that need repair and that even through this western lens of you know you can walk into any pharmacy and buy lube you can walk into any you know, town sex shop and buy vibrators and condoms and, you know, whatever. But still, at the end of the day, for a lot of us, sex is still pretty meaningless because we don't have context for it. And and this somatic element is really where the context, you know, where the rubber meets the road, I guess. So it's it's not just about how many orgasms you can have in one session, but what does it mean to you to be able to have orgasms? And And frankly, who cares? I mean, I think some people care, you know, but... To, to us as, in, as you know the people having them why does mm-hmm. it matter and and why do mm. you care you know so. mm. yes. oh. <laughs> wonderful catching well. up with you roger and uh and i look forward to so much more thank you so much my thank you 